Mankind has been striving for remote horizons and unconquered peaks since the beginning of times. The fascinating mysteries of the creation of the world have always excited inquiring minds and spurred people on in their exploration of the world around us and in their attempts to find the key to understanding it. This mindset has allowed humans to explore our home planet and then venture beyond, out into the cold and forbidding cosmos. Today, I invite you to join me on a journey beyond the boundaries of the universe. We will start out a long way off from the Earth, next to the first ever space probes, which left our home planet a long time ago. Our next stop will be the stellar system closest to us, called Alpha Centauri. After that, we'll be bound for Fermil Hort, Arcturus and other fascinating closest stars. After those, we'll get to the dying giant C.W. Leonis, which helps to illustrate how stars are born and how they die. Leaving this star behind, we'll carry on with our journey across the vast expanses of the Milky Way to see giant black holes and dark clouds of interstellar dust with our own eyes. Finally, after leaving the boundaries of our galaxy, we'll get as far from our home planet as to reach the edge of the visible universe. We won't just brush it, but we'll even go beyond the event horizon to try to find out how great our universe actually is. This will be quite a long trip. Let's get ready and we begin. Roughly half a year before this video was posted, on the 15th of April 2021, the automatic space probe New Horizons became the fifth spacecraft in the history of the humanity to go beyond the point of 50 astronomical units from the Sun. It was the voyages that had crossed this mark before, with the probes Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 the first ever to do so. None of these space wanderers are likely to ever return to the Earth. With some of them still active on their missions, others have gone quiet forever. Spacecraft New Horizons Start of mission 19th of January 2006 Distance to Earth 52 astronomical units Speed 14 km per second or 3 astronomical units per year Main goal Pluto and Charon Mission status Successfully completed Condition operational. Just like most other interplanetary space probes, New Horizons performed a gravity assist maneuver near Jupiter before setting out to its target. Not only did it greatly boost the spacecraft's speed, but also allowed it to capture high-quality images of the largest planet in the solar system alongside its satellites. Besides, the probe's cameras captured the first video ever of an erupting volcano on the surface of Jupiter's satellite Io. After the gravity boost had been completed, the probe made for the main target, Pluto. The spacecraft reached the planetoid's environs in January 2015. The mission's main goal was to explore Pluto and Charon from different perspectives that involved taking photos of and mapping these remote space object surfaces. In addition, the probe estimated the magnetic field's values and the solar wind activity close to the objects and collected information about their atmospheres and surface reflection properties. It goes without saying that the program also involved search for Pluto's as yet undetected satellites and more accurate measurements of Pluto's orbit's parameters. Having completed the main mission, the probe continued to be useful. It flew beyond Pluto's orbit and went on to explore objects in the Kuiper Belt. That is how images of Kwawa, R1 and Arakoth were produced. Thanks to the probe's cameras, the distances to the stars Proxima Centauri and Wolf 359 were measured. Unfortunately, the radioisotope generator on board the spacecraft is expected to start running low from 2026 and eventually all the meters will switch off one after another. New Horizons will continue on its way beyond the boundaries of the solar system and by the year 2038, the distance between the probe and the Sun will have grown to be a hundred astronomical units. By that time, the energy generator on board the spacecraft will have stopped operating completely and it will be impossible to get any connection with it. Following a hyperbolic orbit, 
New Horizons will exit our system, never to come back. The same thing happened with two other probes, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. They hit an escape trajectory from the solar system a while ago. In fact, they were the first automatic space probes ever to be sent into interstellar space by humans. Spacecraft Pioneer 10 Start of mission 3rd of March 1972 Distance to Earth 127 astronomical units Speed Approximately 12 km per second or 2.5 astronomical units per year Main goal Jupiter Mission status Successfully completed Condition Not operational the spacecraft reached Jupiter's system on the 4th of December 1973 after completing a 641-day journey through space. During the mission, images of the gas giant's surface and its largest satellites were beamed back to the Earth, and the planet's atmospheric composition and magnetic field were gauged. In addition, Jupiter was found to emit two and a half times more thermal energy than it receives from the Sun. The data, unique at the time, became the basis for understanding the makeup of gas giants and their satellites. The trajectory of the second probe, Pioneer 11 through space, passed Jupiter 2, but its main target was the other gas giant of our system, Saturn. The probe's scientific instruments gauged the planet's magnetic field and the cameras on board took quite a few snapshots not only of the gas giant itself and its system of rings, but also two of its satellites. Titan and Mimas. According to the estimates, the current distance between Pioneer 11 and the center of our system is around 106 astronomical units. On completing their main mission, both probes continued on their way, moving further and further away from the Sun. Unfortunately, both of them are out of range now, with the last signal from Pioneer 10 received back in 2003. The last signal from Pioneer 11 was received in 1995. Supposedly, both of them are now rapidly moving beyond the boundaries of the solar system. Incidentally, having no chance of ever catching up with either of the two probes we are going to talk about next, the Pioneers were launched at a much earlier date. Spacecraft Voyager 1 Start of mission 5th of September 1977 Distance to Earth, 154 astronomical units. Speed, around 17 km per second or 3.6 astronomical units per year. Main goal, Jupiter and Saturn. Mission status, successfully completed. Condition, not fully operational. The contribution of Voyager 1 to the solar system's exploration can hardly be overestimated. It is thanks to this probe that several new Jupiter satellites were discovered, alongside its ring system, which was big news. The Voyager's cameras captured volcano eruptions on Io and provided hard evidence that Jupiter's great red spot is an enormous storm. The probe beamed back hundreds of photos of the largest planet of our solar system and its satellites. After the spacecraft crossed Neptune's orbit, the meters on board sent back a great amount of valuable data about interstellar plasma. Voyager 1 left both the Kuiper Belt and the Heliopause behind a long while ago and is now rapidly crossing the area of the solar system's scattered disk, making for the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It is not only the remotest man-made object in space, but also the fastest of all the spacecraft on their way to exit our system. Being the first space probe to have traveled that far from the center of the solar system, Voyager 1 offered scientists a unique opportunity to study the heliopause. This is the area around our Sun where solar wind pressure and interstellar gas pressure balance. When the charged particles emitted by the star collide with rarefied plasma, elaborate structures form out of elementary particles and magnetic fields. Studying them is crucial for understanding processes taking place in the universe. Unfortunately, by around the year 2025, the power of the radioisotope thermoelectric generators on board the probe will have run out completely and the connection will have been lost. 
In 300 years, Voyager 1 is estimated to reach the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It will take the spacecraft approximately 30,000 years to go clean through. And after that, it will fly beyond the boundaries of the solar system. 10,000 years later still, the probe will fly by the star Gliese 445 at a distance of 1.6 light years, and then it will eventually get lost in the infinite depths of outer space. Speaking about Voyager 1, we can't but mention its twin, launched from the Earth on the 20th of August 1977. Voyager 2 had Saturn, Uranus and Neptune for its targets, but it also approached Jupiter for a gravity boost. It's the images taken by this probe that allowed scientists to assume that there are subsurface oceans on Ganymede and Europa. On reaching Saturn, Voyager 2 gauged the gas giant's temperature and magnetic field and discovered several new satellites. It goes without saying that lots of snapshots were taken of both Saturn's surface and its rings. Next in line on the probe's way were Uranus and Neptune. The flyby yielded a great number of unique snapshots, and in total 17 of the two planet's satellites were discovered. Also it was found that both Uranus and Neptune have ring systems. Under Neptune's gravitational influence, the spacecraft changed its trajectory and left the ecliptic plane. This meant that Voyager 2 wouldn't be able to approach the other objects in the solar system, but it still had other exciting things to look forward to. Thus, the probe was to collect invaluable data about interstellar plasma and cosmic wind, as well as to measure distances to stars and explore the heliosphere. The probe is currently as far as 128 astronomical units away from the center of our system, with the distance growing by 15.37 kilometers every second. It's going to take it around 42,000 years to approach Ross 248, a dim red dwarf in the constellation Andromeda. The minimal distance between Voyager 2 and the star will be about 1.7 light years, and around 300,000 years since its launch, chances are it will fly by Sirius at a distance of 4.3 light years. Unfortunately, it is impossible to distinguish such a tiny object from the Earth that far away. We live at the dawn of space exploration, and interplanetary space probes are just mankind's first timid steps in exploring the infinite universe. It is hard to predict their fate. They may be smashed on collision with a celestial body, or they may be recaptured by our distant descendants, who will have advanced into stellar travel technologies to the point of being able to catch up with the probes. For all we know, they might recover them from space and put on display in a museum. But it is more likely that the fragile apparatuses are destined to drift on for years and years through the lifeless expanses, and millions of years later, Radioactive rays and rare particles of cosmic dust whizzing through the probes time and time again will eventually wear them down to threadbare debris to be scattered across the depths of the universe without a trace. The Earth has been emitting structured radio signals into space for around a hundred years now. The radio noise from the Earth reached dozens of other stellar systems long ago, including Arcturus, lying 37 light-years away from us, and Daudebaran, which is roughly 65 light-years away. Besides, our radio signals may be heard on the surfaces of a great number of potentially habitable exoplanets, like Ross 128b or Gliese 667cc. Still, the triple stellar system of Alpha Centauri remains the closest neighbor of the Sun, which automatically makes it the first obvious candidate for the destination of the first ever interstellar flight. Alpha Centauri is known to be a multiple stellar system made up of three components. Two of the larger ones are relatively close to each other. Seen with the naked eye, they appear to be a single source of light. The two components follow a slightly elongated orbit around the common mass center, which takes around 80 years to complete. The maximal distance between the stars may reach 35 astronomical units, with the minimal distance reaching 11.2 astronomical units. As for the distance between these objects and the Sun, it is reportedly 4.36 light-years. 
The most massive, the largest and the brightest component in the system is dubbed Alpha Centauri A. This is a main sequence star with a mass of about 108% that of the Sun. Its radius is reportedly 1.22 times that of our Sun. Even though the surface temperature and the spectral class of Alpha Centauri A are close to those of our star, it emits one and a half times as much energy. There are no confirmed exoplanets in the environs of this star. However, while the star was being observed in the infrared in 2021, some evidence was found of there being a planet-like object close by. According to preliminary estimates, its mass may be anything from 9 to 35 Earth masses and its radius may measure 3.3 to 7 times that of our planet. 1.1 astronomical units away from its parent star, the hypothetical celestial body completes a full orbit around it within roughly a year. Additional observations are called for to verify the data, which can be done with the help of either the James Webb telescope or else Earth-based observatories. The second component of the system is called Alpha Centauri b, or Ptolemy, and it also falls into the class of main sequence stars. However, its mass is 10% less than that of the Sun, and its radius measures only 86% or so that of the Sun. Ptolemy is also slightly cooler than our star. Its surface temperature is reportedly 5260 Kelvin, or slightly lower than 5000 degrees Celsius. With these factors combined, the celestial object has an orange hue and its luminosity is on average twice as low as that of our Sun. Incidentally, Alpha Centauri b emits a lot more energy in the X-ray range compared with other objects of its class. Besides, the star is peculiar for its temper and there are bright flares and ejections to be seen on its surface. No confirmed exoplanets have been detected near this star either in 2012, a group of astronomers from the Geneva Observatory put forward a suggestion that there was a planet very close to it, whose orbital period was around 12 days and whose radius measured slightly less than that of the Earth. The suggestion was made based on four years of observation of the star's proper motion. However, three years later, a mathematical error was detected to have been made in the course of data processing and so the idea of there being a planet was found to be erroneous. The third component of the system is a stark contrast to the first two. It is a red dwarf with a mass approximately 12% that of the Sun. Its size is about seven times smaller than that of the Sun. Its surface temperature is only slightly higher than 3000 Kelvin and its luminosity is just a measly 0.17% that of the Sun. Of all the components of the Alpha Centauri system, it is this dim space object that is the closest one to the Sun, lying 4.25 light-years away from it. This is what earned it its name, Proxima Centauri, which is Latin for closest. Besides, the object is getting nearer and nearer. Thus, in 26,700 years, it will be only a bit more than 3 light-years away. Still, this star cannot be seen from the Earth on account of its low luminosity. Proxima is noticeably far from its two companions in the stellar system. This distance is currently around 13,000 astronomical units or 0.21 light-years, but in the next 300,000 years it is expected to gradually shrink to just 4,100 astronomical units. It takes Proxima 547,000 years to orbit around the system's common mass center. Unlike its two larger neighbors, the Proxima Centauri system boasts two confirmed exoplanets, as well as at least one hypothetical object. Besides, studies of the star in the infrared allowed scientists to assume that there is a dust ring and probably a great number of small celestial objects, like asteroids or comets. The first planet in the system, Proxima Centauri b, was detected in 2016 by the radial velocities method. Four years later, in 2020, it was confirmed by spectrographic studies with the help of the largest Earth-based telescope on our planet, VLT, the Very Large Telescope. According to the updates, 
The exoplanet lies 0.05 astronomical units away from its parent star and it takes it roughly 11 Earth days to complete a full orbit. Estimates show that the planet's mass is 10 to 20 percent bigger than that of the Earth and its radius measures about 1.3 times that of our planet. Mathematical modeling revealed that Proxima Centauri b gets about one and a half times as little thermal energy from its star as does the Earth from the Sun. Its average temperature is 234 Kelvin or 39 degrees Celsius below zero which means that hypothetically there could be liquid water in some areas on the planet. As the celestial body is extremely close to its host star however, it is likely to be tidally locked so it faces the star with one and the same side. A dense atmosphere could compensate for sharp contrasts in temperatures, which are inevitable in such conditions, but just like any other red dwarfs, Proxima Centauri is often seen to eject stellar matter. Also, ionizing radiation flares are observed. It is assumed that such activity gradually destroys the atmosphere of the closest objects. A powerful magnetic field that could be encompassing Proxima Centauri b could offer some protection against the destructive process, but chances that there is any magnetic field there are thin. In the year 2020, another planet was confirmed to exist in the system. A space object dubbed Proxima Centauri c lies roughly one and a half astronomical units away from the center of the system. Its orbital cycle is slightly over five years, as for the object's mass, it may be six to eight times that of the Earth, but its radius hasn't been estimated at the time this video is posted. Depending on its size, meanwhile, the exoplanet will fall either in the category of mini-Neptunes or super-Earths. As Proxima Centauri c lies quite a big distance away from its parent star, its temperature is remarkably low, about 39 Kelvin or 234 degrees Celsius below zero. According to some observations, the planet may have a ring system whose radius is roughly five times that of Jupiter. Also, based on the latest data from VLT, a remarkably small exoplanet is expected to lie 0.029 astronomical units away from its parent star, whose mass is about 25% that of the Earth. If it does exist, and if this isn't another measurement error, a year on this planet lasts about five Earth days and the surface temperature there could be 360 Kelvin or 87 degrees Celsius. Whether this space object is really there or not remains an open question and additional confirmations are called for. Alpha Centauri has been listening to our radio signals for over a hundred years now. But the 40 trillion kilometers of space vacuum between us are too overwhelming for us to cover at this point. It takes light over four years to get there but for humans, such speeds are still in the realm of fancy. Even today's swiftest state-of-the-art spacecraft would need tens of thousands of years to cover this distance. However, application of advanced technologies could theoretically greatly reduce travel time. Since the very dawn of space exploration, projects of a great number of spacecraft have been suggested that hypothetically would have been able to negotiate interstellar distances Nevertheless, not a single one of them has been actually designed. Most of these would-be missions were forgotten, but one is still under active consideration. This is the Breakthrough Starshot program, which implies sending as many as a thousand microprobes to Proxima Centauri as soon as in the first half of this century. They will not measure over a centimeter in size, and special thin and durable sails are planned to be created to aid the probes along. The sails will be blown out, as it were, by impulses of a highly powerful Earth-based laser. Estimates show that an interstellar probe like that is going to be leaving the solar system at a speed roughly 20% that of the speed of light, with the overall travel time around 20 years. After that, it will take another five years or so for the data collected by the mission to reach the Earth. There are approximately 1,400 stellar systems in space within the radius of 50 light-years from the solar system. Some of them are multiple and contain two and more objects, which makes the overall number of our stellar neighbors over 2,000. These are all sorts of stars, from dim red dwarfs to dazzling giants whose temperatures are beyond our imagination. 
The incredible scale and great abundance of space objects in all their diversity can't but amaze. Life's too short to give account of each and every one of them. Right now, we are going to travel at incredible speeds, by far faster than the speed of light. It will take us just a few minutes to cover dozens of light years of space. We'll get to check out quite a few remarkable space objects around the solar system. Other worlds and stars are already waiting. After we fly round Proxima Centauri, a detour of 11 light years that would have passed in the blink of an eye, we're in the environs of the dim red dwarf known as Ross 128. We can't see it from the Earth with the naked eye. Unprepossessing though it may seem, there is an Earth-like exoplanet dubbed Ross 128b orbiting this star. This exoplanet is one of the closest to us. Unlike the yet closer and cooler Proxima Centauri b, the temperature on Ross 128b is relatively moderate, ranging from minus 60 to plus 21 degrees Celsius. Assuming its surface to be identical to that of our planet, which absorbs 70% of the light shed on it, the equilibrium temperature of Ross 128b is estimated at around 7 degrees Celsius. It is 8 degrees cooler than that of today's Earth, but quite enough to sustain life. The exoplanet's mass is roughly 35% bigger than that of the Earth. The radius hasn't been accurately measured at this point, but provided the planet's composition is similar to our Earth's, its diameter is supposed to be roughly 10% bigger than that of the Earth. The freefall acceleration on its surface is expected to be just 12% bigger than that on our planet. If all these estimations are correct, then the conditions on the surface of Ross 128b are supposed to be comparable with those on the Earth. Besides, the system is rapidly moving to meet the Sun. In just 79,000 years, it will be closer to us than Proxima Centauri, which is moving away from us. Quite like most exoplanets we know of, Ross 128b is located quite close to its host star. The distance from it to the center of the system is just 0.05 astronomical units, or 20 times shorter than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. It takes the exoplanet slightly under 10 days to complete a full orbit around its star. It is also thought that it must be tidally locked. Speaking about its host star, Ross 128, its mass is approximately 17% that of the Sun, with the radius measuring around 0.2 that of the Sun. The star's surface temperature is twice as low as that of the Sun, at 3192 Kelvin, and its luminosity is roughly 300 times lower than that of the Sun. It's worth mentioning that Ross 128 is a comparatively quiet star. With its luminosity quite stable and regular, it hardly ever flares up or emits stellar matter, so pernicious for all living things. Moving on through space, 12 light years in the direction pointing away from the Sun, we will see Lytton's star, also known as GJ273. It boasts one of the largest planetary systems detected in the space nearest to us. The star itself is a red dwarf of an orange hue, whose mass is just 25% that of the Sun. Its radius is three times smaller than that of the Sun and its luminosity is 435 times lower so it's hardly surprising that it can only be seen through a telescope. It is quite an exciting star, because there are as many as four objects detected in its environs, two of which are confirmed exoplanets. The other two are still prospective candidates, awaiting confirmation. The first confirmed exoplanet was dubbed Lytton B. It was detected thanks to high-precision measurement of the star's proper motion. The object's mass is estimated to be about 2.89 times that of the Earth. Its radius is 35% bigger than that of our planet. This makes the object a super-Earth, and its surface gravity may turn out to be suitable for humans. The distance between the system's center and light and B equals roughly 0.1 astronomical units, although the amount of light received by the exoplanet from its parent star is comparable with that received by us from the Sun. Thus, Light and B lies in its star's habitable zone and may well be considered a potential candidate for searching for alien life. The equilibrium surface temperature of the planet is 259 to 292 Kelvin or minus 14 to plus 19 degrees Celsius. 
This makes the conditions on light and be quite suitable for humans. The other confirmed exoplanet in the system is light and sea. With this space object's mass similar to that of the Earth, it lies much closer to its host star. The exact parameters of its orbit haven't been defined yet, but it is known that it takes the object just 4.7 days to complete a full orbit around its system's center. It is likely that this is a scorching hot and harsh celestial body without any atmosphere, with one on the same side facing the star at all times. The two other objects in the system were discovered in 2019 and are still awaiting confirmation of their status. According to preliminary estimates, they are ice giants with masses from 5 to 15 times that of the Earth. With the radii of their orbits lying within 0.8 astronomical units, their orbital periods cannot be over 558 days. Lytton is a relatively cold star, and with these two objects lying beyond its habitable zone, their temperatures are almost certainly extremely low. It goes without saying that at this stage, these two candidates still want further exploration. Moving on and away from the Lytton system, we will come across a star known as Altair. Lying 16.8 light years away from the Earth, it is a bright, white blue star. Its mass is around 1.8 that of the Sun, and its age is estimated at around 1.2 billion years. This star's luminosity is 11 times that of the Sun, which makes it one of the most conspicuous objects in our night sky. Another curious feature of Altair is its rotation, which is remarkably fast. Thus, it spins on its axis approximately 67 times faster than the Sun. It completes a full rotation within slightly less than 9 hours. The velocity of star material at the equator equals about 286 km per second due to this outstandingly rapid rotation. The star's shape is far from an ideal sphere. The star's equatorial diameter is 22% bigger than the distance between its poles and is roughly twice the diameter of the Sun. The star's shape can't but affect its temperature and luminosity, which also differ in its different areas. The stellar matter in the equatorial zone of the star is noticeably colder and darker than in the poles. The temperature at the equator is just 6,900 Kelvin. The poles, meanwhile, are as hot as 8,500 Kelvin, which is around 8,200 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, the fact that Altair has an irregular shape was first arrived at following theoretical calculations. Only later, in 2007, was it finally confirmed after an image of the star was produced, where it is seen to have a disc-like shape. Actually, Altair happened to become the first star beyond the solar system whose surface had been imaged. Unfortunately, no planet has been detected in Altair's environs. Still, observations show rings or a fog of gas enveloping the star. Altair's light is dispersed in these structures, which produces a curious effect. This major interference of light results in a humongous rainbow around the star. On the downside, however, even though it looks fascinating and majestic, it partly conceals this star and so greatly hampers studying it. As we carry on on our way through space, we will get as far as Fomalhaut. Lying 25 light years away from the Earth, this stellar system consists of three components. For a long time, the three components making it up used to be considered mutually independent space objects. Then, in 2013, evidence showed that they are in fact gravitationally bound, forming a large and single structure in space. Fomalhaut is probably the widest multiple star system located close to ours, the biggest distance between its components reaches 3.2 light-years. Incidentally, almost 11 lunar disks may be placed in our night sky between the remotest objects in the Fomalhaut system. The largest, most well-known and well-seen component of the system is referred to as Fomalhaut A. It's a young and hot star whose mass is 92% bigger than that of the Sun, with its radius measuring around 1.85 times that of the Sun. It was this star that people have referred to as Fomalhaut since ancient times, quite unaware of the fact that there are other, not so easily observable components in this system. The star's luminosity is remarkably high, at 16 times that of the Sun. 
Its temperature is estimated at roughly 8,500 Kelvin or 8,200 degrees Celsius. Thermal hout could be as old as 400 to 480 million years. According to today's models of stellar evolution, the star may grow to be around 1 billion years old. On reaching this age, it will more likely than not go supernova and turn into a white dwarf. Thermal hout A is surrounded by a disk of protoplanetary gas and dust. Divided into several segments, its inner radius is 133 astronomical units, with a width measuring about 25 astronomical units. This disk is thought to be an active stellar nursery, with celestial bodies regularly born there. That is why it is an area of keen interest for astronomers. It used to be thought that there was a massive planet lurking somewhere in Fermal Hout's environs. It was even given a name, Dagon. However, further observations showed that there was hardly any planet there after all. It must have been a wide cloud of dust that was taken for an exoplanet. It would have originated on collision of asteroids and comets. 0.9 light years away from the main component of the system, there lies Fermal Hout B also known as T.W. Pisces Ostrini. It's an orange dwarf with a mass around 70% that of the Sun, with its radius roughly 63% that of the Sun. The star's surface temperature is estimated at approximately 4,700 Kelvin, which is 4,400 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, the star's luminosity is much lower than that of the Sun. Our host star is five times brighter. In 2019, on carrying out spectral and proper motion analysis, scientists put forward a suggestion that there might be a celestial body as heavy as 0.6 to 1.9 Jupiter masses orbiting the star. The existence of this body still remains to be confirmed and its exact orbit's parameters calculated precisely. At this point, preliminary estimations show that it should take the hypothetical planet 25 years to complete a full orbit around its host star. The third star in the Fermal Hout system is LP876-10. It is a red dwarf lying two and a half light years away from the main component of the system. The star is five times lighter than the Sun, and its surface temperature is slightly over 3100 Kelvin. It takes LP876-10 approximately 20 million years to complete a full orbit around Fermal Hout A. Apparently, the red dwarf would have orbited its big brother just 22 times since the birth of the system. As for planets or exoplanet candidates, none of these have so far been detected near the star. Still, observations allow us to suppose that there is a cloud of gas and dust around it, whose radius is anything from 10 to 40 astronomical units. Our next and final destination for today is 37.3 light years away from the Earth. That's the distance we would have covered now to reach Arcturus, the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere and the fourth brightest star in the night sky. The star is the main component of a binary star system. It is an orange giant whose life is now slowly drawing to a close. Most of its hydrogen has already been transformed into helium and now the star is busy burning the remains of its stellar fuel and gradually expanding in size. Arcturus is also the brightest star of a great stellar stream named in its honor. This gargantuan structure is in fact the debris of a dwarf galaxy absorbed by the Milky Way some 2 billion years ago. It contains 53 stars. Most of them are old and dim and not nearly as impressive as Arcturus. Arcturus emits 170 times as much luminous energy as the Sun, although its surface temperature is much lower at just 4,251 Kelvin. It is thought that this giant used to be quite like our Sun because its mass is just 10% bigger. But what with the inevitable depletion of its stellar fuel and the inner pressure of its scorching hot plasma, the star turned into an orange giant whose radius is now 25 times that of the Sun. According to today's theory of stellar evolution, this is something that our Sun is expected to go through in the distant future too. Arcturus's age is gauged at anything from 6 to 8.5 billion years. It is hard to predict when it will go supernova at the end of its life cycle, but it will happen quite soon in astronomical terms. Shedding its outer layers, Arcturus will become a scorching hot white dwarf, 
destined to slowly cool off in the course of billions of years to follow. The second component of the system is barely visible against the background of its giant companion. This small star with luminosity 20 times lower than that of Arcturus lies so close to it that it's hardly possible to define its parameters. Even if some planets did manage to form in this stellar system, many millions of years ago they must have been absorbed by Arcturus itself. Either way, no objects have been detected in the star's environs at this point. Before we set out on a space journey beyond the boundaries of our system, we have to decide on the manner of selecting a planet that resembles the Earth most from thousands of candidates. What should be the parameters of this fascinating world and what should we take into consideration first? It goes without saying that planets favorable for the genesis and sustenance of life have always posed considerable interest to scientists. However, it is no easy matter to single out suitable celestial bodies among a great number of those discovered by now. To have clear-cut selection criteria, scientists worked out the so-called Earth Similarity Index, or ESI for short. It is based on several principal parameters, a planet's radius, density, and average surface temperature. This combination makes it possible to calculate the object's mass, approximately estimate its chemical composition, gravitation level, whether or not there is an atmosphere, and if there is, analyze some of its characteristics. It also helps establish if there is liquid water on the planet's surface and other information. The standard of this index is the Earth, with its parameters assumed as ideal and its CSI equaling 1. Based on the Earth's similarity index, all the objects known to us conventionally fall into three categories. The first one is objects whose ESI is under 0.5. These are for the most part gas and dice giants, as well as extremely hot or on the contrary cold objects. This is the category most of the solar system planets and satellites fall into. It takes just one characteristic to greatly exceed the maximum permissible values for a celestial object to be unfavorable for the genesis and sustenance of life. Let's take Venus for instance. The radius and mass of this celestial body are very close to those of the Earth. However, due to its close proximity to the Sun and a dense atmosphere, its surface temperature is extremely high. That is why, in spite of a close similarity to the Earth on the face of it, Venus's ESI is not high, at just 0.44. Of course, there being any life on its surface is totally out of the question. Celestial objects whose ESI is within 0.5 to 0.7 fall into the second category. These objects resemble our home planet noticeably more. They are mostly rocky worlds with relatively moderate temperatures, but it can also be ocean planets and even some large satellites. Incidentally, a high Earth similarity index per se does not warrant favorable conditions for life. For example, quite often low-mass planets are incapable of retaining a dense enough atmosphere, while their magnetic field is too weak to protect the surface from lethally dangerous radiation. Other celestial bodies yet may happen to be located too close to their parent star and so get tidally locked. Of course, all these factors greatly reduce the chances of life's genesis and sustenance. As for the third category, it contains celestial bodies with a high ESI, that is over 0.7. All of these planets are beyond the solar system. According to estimates, the size of these worlds and the conditions on their surfaces are potentially close to those of the Earth. Among these planets, there is one which resembles ours most, and it lies just 12 and a half light years away from the Earth. This amazing world orbits Tea Garden star, a small red dwarf discovered in 2003. This star is 1,370 times dimmer than the Sun. This means that it cannot be observed with the naked eye even though it lies quite close to the Earth. The mass of this tiny star is roughly 9% that of the Sun and its radius is about 5% bigger than that of Jupiter. Gravitational forces are barely strong enough to maintain the thermonuclear reaction in the star's interior. That is why the surface temperature is just 2,900 Kelvin, or roughly 2,630 degrees Celsius. 
As is the case for all red dwarfs, D Garden Star's habitable zone is comparatively narrow and located very close to it. Back in 2019, two exoplanets were detected in its system after continuous observations of the star's proper motion. Interestingly, one of them lies beyond the star's habitable zone and the other within. The outer planet, dubbed T Garden C, follows an almost ideal circular orbit around the system's center. With the orbit's radius 0.045 astronomical units, it is completed every 11 and a half days. It is presumably a rocky celestial body with a mass 11% bigger than that of the Earth. Its radius is estimated to be approximately 3.5% bigger than that of our planet. Unfortunately, conditions on Teagard and C's surface are far from hospitable. Due to the low luminosity of its parent star, the object enjoys 63% less energy than what the Earth receives from the Sun. As a result, the planet's surface temperature is gauged at 47 degrees Celsius below zero on average, which is too low for life sustenance, at least in the forms we know it. Still, the chance of there being vast oceans of salty water concealed under a thick layer of ice on Tea Garden Sea, as is the case with Jupiter's satellites, for instance, shouldn't be ruled out. As for the inner planet, it is dubbed T Garden B. It is actually this planet that is the most Earth-like object of all those discovered to date. Its CSI is 0.95, which is just 0.05 less than the standard ideal value of our Earth. This celestial body lies 0.025 astronomical units away from its star and it takes it roughly five days to complete a full orbit around it. By following a practically circular orbit, the exoplanet is constantly in its star's habitable zone and it receives 15% more radiation from it than the Earth from the Sun. According to some estimates, T Garden B's mass is just 5% more than that of our planet. As for its radius, it differs from that of the Earth by a minuscule ratio, which means that the gravitation value is also quite close to what we're used to on our home planet. This makes it logical to assume that the inner makeup of the exoplanet is highly likely to be similar to that of the Earth. There is a massive metallic core coated in a thick layer of molten silicate mantle reckoned to be at the center of the planet. The celestial object's outer part is covered with a relatively thin crust of solidified rocks. Mathematical modeling shows that the average temperature of T Garden B is 28 degrees Celsius, which is 14 degrees more than that of the Earth. This means that conditions on its surface allow the planet to have and retain a notion of liquid water, and the planet's temperature profile is potentially favorable for most microorganisms. Even though T Garden B is quite massive, and is capable of retaining a comparatively dense atmosphere, the radial velocities method, which is used for exoplanets detection, is quite inadequate for obtaining any information about the atmosphere's composition. But it should be borne in mind that a planet's temperature profile directly depends on its atmosphere's composition. For example, a dense atmosphere with a high percentage of methane and carbon dioxide will cause a strong greenhouse effect. Dense clouds of water vapor, meanwhile, will on the contrary reflect sun rays, which reduces temperatures. We should also remember that no matter how optimistic the parameters of this fascinating celestial body might appear, it is not entirely flawless. Being in close proximity to its parent star, it seems that T Garden B is always facing it with one on the same side, which causes sharp temperature differences between the day side and the shadow side, as I've already mentioned, T Garden's star is a red dwarf, and this class demonstrates a tendency to suddenly flare up. The amplitude of fluctuations in its luminosity may reach 30%, which greatly affects the planets located close by. Still, the chances of T Garden B's capability of sustaining life are high. Biological creatures often demonstrate incredible viability, and their ability to adapt can't but amaze. For example, the ocean could serve as protection against lethal radiation and sharp temperature fluctuations. Its upper layer is potentially capable of absorbing cosmic radiation, while its currents could dissipate temperature contrasts. 
For all we know, as time goes by, primitive organisms might evolve in the warm depths saturated with energy and microelements. Just a tiny chance is sometimes enough for life to develop into something bigger. Six hundred and fifty light years away from the Earth, there lies IRC plus 10 to 16, a majestic star also known as CW Leonis. Its radius at its pulsation peak may reach 560 times that of the Sun, which is about 2.6 times the distance from the Earth to our parent star. With CW Leonis hypothetically placed in the middle of our system, all the planets as far as Mars would find themselves under its surface, which would even brush the inner boundary of the asteroid belt. Incidentally, the star's mass is not that great, roughly 1.5 to 4 solar masses. Its surface temperature is just 2300 Kelvin or about 2000 degrees Celsius. But due to its impressive dimensions, the star emits on average 8,500 times more energy than our Sun. Like any other red giant, C.W. Leonis is in its final life stage. Its age hasn't been defined precisely, but it is estimated to be several billion years. It is assumed that in its salad days, C.W. Leonis was a white blue star with a mass three to five times that of the Sun. However, by one billion years ago, a great part of the celestial body's hydrogen had burned out and transformed into helium. Slowly settling in the star's center, the helium ousted all the remaining hydrogen and formed a scorching hot core which did not participate in any thermonuclear reactions. This process, typical for all stars whose mass is close to that of the Sun, is the starting point for a star's transformation into a red giant. The star's inner pressure causes it to expand to great proportions which renders the outer layers more rarefied and unstable. The space object's diameter grows to be dozens of times greater, with its color gradually assuming a blood-red hue. A thermonuclear reaction still takes place in the star's depths, which causes the pressure and temperature of the stellar plasma to increase. At a certain point, this unleashes a chain reaction of nuclear fusion, where helium nuclei are transformed into carbon. This is the so-called helium flash. It is a complex, multi-level physical process that dramatically transforms the star's inner structure. With its core incredibly heating up, its outer layers, on the contrary, cool off and darken. There are currently great amounts of carbon in C.W. Leonis, but its mass isn't sufficient to hit the next level of nucleosynthesis. As a result, the thermonuclear combustion in the object's interior becomes unstable. The stellar matter gradually cools off and shrinks under the influence of gravitation. This heats up the star's interior again, and the reaction is unleashed with a new force. After receiving a new portion of thermal energy, the stellar matter expands again, and the combustion dies down. It is assumed that this cyclic process underlies the occasional changes of the star's luminosity. C.W. Leonis has a 649-day pulsation cycle and with the luminosity at its peak is 11,300 times brighter than the Sun. With the luminosity at its lowest, meanwhile, the object emits 6,250 times more energy than the Sun. At the moment of contraction, the upper layers of stellar matter partly detach themselves from the star. This forms a carbon-oxygen gas nebula that the star is enveloped in. According to some estimates, C.W. Leonis loses 4 times 10 to the power of 22 tons of material every year on account of this process, an amount approximately 7 times the mass of the Earth. Observations show that the circumstellar nebula is not less than 69,000 years old and its mass is about 1.5 times that of the Sun. As for its size, it reaches 84,000 astronomical units. The nebula has an elaborate structure with bulges and pockets of gas, as well as half arcs and irregular rings. 
It is posited that these formations appeared due to magnetic activity and stellar wind generated by the unstable star close by. The chemical composition of the cloud C. W. Leonis is shrouded in is of great interest to explorers. Spectral analysis data reveals it to contain around 70 different chemical compounds, for example carbon dioxide, water and ammonia, to name but a few. There are also quite a lot of elements from the upper part of Mendeleev's periodic table, right down to iron. C. W. Leonis may have had planets in the past, but they appear to have been swallowed up early on at the stage of expansion. In any event, years of observations did not reveal distinct traces of their existence in the past. What was registered was subtle changes in the star's orbit back in 1994, and more recently, in 2017, mysterious shifts of matter were detected in the cloud of gas and dust enveloping the star. Some small red dwarf orbiting the giant could well account for these phenomena, although attempts to detect its radiation have so far been unsuccessful. This could be due to the nebula close by, which disperses and reflects the energy flow from sources of light located nearby. This phenomenon camouflages any objects in the immediate environs and prevents them from being accurately recognized. The mass of C. W. Leonis's hypothetical stellar companion is assumed to be definitely smaller than that of the Sun, and it should take it approximately a hundred years to complete a full orbit around the giant. Another outstanding feature is a comparatively high water content in the star's environs and envelope. At first, it was posited that the star would melt and swallow up icy comets as it expanded. However, Observations carried out in 2009 showed the temperature of some spectral lines to reach a thousand Kelvin, which is possible only on condition that water vapor forms actually in the upper layers of the giant. This fact did not fit in the model of red giant's structure accepted at the time, according to which all oxygen and stellar matter necessary for water synthesis must be used up completely to produce carbon monoxide. A new hypothesis was put forward to account for the witnessed phenomena, which stated that molecules of silicon oxides and carbon are destroyed by a powerful ultraviolet radiation. After that, the released oxygen reacts with hydrogen and there forms scorching hot water vapor. The weakness of this hypothesis is in the failure to account for the source of ultraviolet radiation. Reactions like that may occur only in rather high temperatures that is within stellar matter. However, it is practically impervious to cosmic rays. This paradox may be explained by yet another assumption. Since the star is unstable, large ruptures and low-density areas occasionally occur on its surface, where ultraviolet radiation is not blocked out that effectively. The water vapor's overall mass in the star's atmosphere and outer layers is estimated at several quintillion tons. Enormous though this figure may seem, in fact, water accounts for just around a billionth of the star's overall mass. According to today's notions of stellar evolution, being a red giant, C. W. Leonis is in its autumn years now. It will deplete its stellar fuel in the next 10 to 30,000 years, after which it will discard its outer layers following a powerful explosion. It will transform into an incredibly hot and dense space object a white dwarf. Its mass will be roughly 80% that of the Sun and its temperature will reach several million degrees in the first seconds after the transformation. However, with no energy source, it is destined to slowly and irrevocably fade in the course of billions of years to follow. Eventually, the celestial body will be almost invisible against the background of cosmic emptiness when it becomes a mysterious black dwarf. But this will not happen any time soon. The shock wave and the mind-boggling temperature in the epicenter will generate new elements that are not to be found in a star's interior. For example, uranium, gold and lead. They will later become part of new celestial objects. Millions of years later yet, radioactive decay will heat the planet's interiors, melt the ice and saturate the oceans with microelements, thus creating conditions for the genesis of life. 
The universe is constantly evolving, and global cataclysms and destruction are an inalienable part of this process. But at the end of every storm, there are fresh rays of light. Long before telescopes had been invented, people could observe a light strip crossing the heavens. The fascinating and mysterious phenomenon prompted a multitude of legends, but it took thousands of years of scientific progress to finally account for it. It turned out that the Milky Way wasn't a path of gods. What it is, is the dissipated light of billions of stars too remote to distinguish each one separately. The idea of the stars around us making up part of a single structure of enormous dimensions was first suggested by Immanuel Kant back in 1755. He also assumed that some nebulae discovered by scientists could in fact be remote star clusters, that is, other galaxies. This ingenious guess was well ahead of its time, with the philosopher's contemporaries initially dismissing it. Only in the early 20th century did the progress of observation equipment enable scientists to confirm the existence of other galaxies, and in 1936 Edwin Hubble devised a classification system. Many of its principles are still referred to by scientists today. According to the system, the Milky Way falls into the category of barred spiral galaxies, although it took a long while before it had assumed its today's looks. Our galaxy is quite an old one, since the stars in its central globular clusters were born as far back as around 13 billion years ago. At the same time, there are some areas in the Milky Way where stars are actively born, which means that there is always a fresh supply of young stars. The collected data points to the fact that the Milky Way is a comparatively large galaxy in astronomical terms. The diameter of its disk measures as much as 200,000 light years, with a halo reaching out into space much deeper yet. Our galaxy is home to at least 200 billion various stars, as well as 25 to 100 billion brown dwarfs. In addition, it contains over a trillion planets. Countless small celestial objects as well as clouds of cosmic dust and interstellar gas, which may reach gigantic dimensions. At the same time, regular matter accounts for a small ratio in the galaxy. Around 90% of the Milky Way's overall mass is the so-called dark matter. The amount of light emitted by this mysterious and widespread substance is negligible. However, dark matter plays an active role in gravitational interaction. Even though most of the galactic mass remains invisible, we can still calculate it. To that end, scientists refer to stars' trajectories of movement around the center of the Milky Way. According to the estimates, the overall mass of our galaxy reaches 0.8 to 1.5 trillion solar masses. The structure of the Milky Way is quite elaborate. We'll start our journey today from its center. This area of the galaxy is shrouded in massive clouds of gas and dust, but by happy chance we can observe it through the so-called Barda's window, an area of space with lower amounts of dust. Just like most spiral galaxies, the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole in its center, which is surrounded with an accretion disk with a radius roughly three light years. Dubbed Sagittarius A star, it is the closest object of this class to us. Its mass is 4.3 million solar masses, and its radius isn't over 16 million kilometers, which is three times smaller than Mercury's orbit. The first data about the nature of the object in the center of our galaxy was acquired in the course of long observations and thorough calculations. Only as recently as on May 12, 2022, was it possible to get the first image with the help of the EHT network of radio telescopes, and so the earlier hypotheses were confirmed. The area in the center of our galaxy is highly populated. More than 6,000 stars have already been detected within three light years from the black hole, with the orbits of some of them defined rather accurately. For example, there is a white-blue star, designation S62, which is 17.8 astronomical units away from the black hole on its closest approach to it. 
while moving at 6.7% the speed of light. Classical mechanics laws are inadequate for description of the trajectory of movement of a star as swift as that because of relativistic effects. Just to illustrate, the axis of its orbit shifts by 75 angular minutes with every completed orbit. Besides, when crossing this area in space, we can see several large star clusters with a total mass of around 1 million solar masses. And slightly further, roughly 200 light years away, another massive black hole is likely to be lurking, whose mass should be around 100,000 times that of the Sun. Traveling further on, we will reach the central molecular cloud, an irregularly shaped area measuring 1600 to 1900 light years, whose mass is over 60 million solar masses. There are a great many stellar nurseries and gas nebulae, as well as protostars and remnants of supernovae. Most of the cloud's matter is dense hydrogen, whose temperature fluctuates between 50 and 600 Kelvin, which corresponds to 223 degrees Celsius below zero to 327 degrees Celsius above zero. Spectral analysis shows the gigantic nebula to contain carbon monoxide, methyl alcohol and hydrocyanic acid in addition to hydrogen. Having receded from the Milky Way's center a bit, we will see that it is encompassed by a bulge, a bright and massive formation of an elliptical shape. With its length reaching 10,000 light years, its transverse diameter is roughly 7 light years. The total mass of the bulge is as much as 10 billion times that of the Sun. The exact number of the stars cannot be calculated because their radiation blends and renders any estimates unrealistic. Being elongated, the bulge forms the so-called bar stretching for approximately 13,000 light years and serving as the base for spiral galactic arms. It is here, at one of its ends, that we can see the star cluster Stevenson II, containing the largest known star today. Its designation is Stevenson II-18, and its radius is 2,150 times that of the Sun. Unfortunately, chances of finding exoplanets orbiting this outstanding object are quite minuscule. Even if planets did exist at some point in the past, the hypergiant would have swallowed them up while it was expanding. The galaxy's center is home to billions of stars and apparently a great number of exoplanets. Chances of encountering a potentially habitable world among this great multitude are much lower than in less populated areas of the galaxy. This is due to the fact that when a big number of stars are located close together, they destabilize exoplanets' orbits while their powerful radiation is lethal to all living things. That is why a special area in the galaxy is defined as the habitable zone. It looks like a ring, with a radius measuring 22 to 29,000 light years and contains star systems with the most favorable conditions for the genesis of biological life. Worlds encompassed by the ring languish in exposure to excessive radiation while beyond the ring, there's a lack of heavy elements. However, mathematical modeling shows that stars within galaxies are able to migrate thousands of light years away, thus either leaving the habitable zone or entering it. Consequently, with an exoplanet lying within the zone, it does not automatically suggest favorable conditions on it. Moving on away from the center of the Milky Way, we will have a chance to check out its most impressive part, the galactic disk. It is made up of two components with different properties. The first one, known as the thin disk, measures 1000 to 1300 light years in thickness and its visible radius measures as much as 50,000 light years. On the edge, it gradually dissipates with the outermost stars lying up to 100,000 light years away from the galaxy's center. This part of the Milky Way contains around 80% of the galaxy's visible mass and in fact it was the last component to have formed. As for the thick disk, its diameter is comparable to that of the thin disk but is four times as thick and is much more rarefied. It is made up of old stars and is practically devoid of interstellar gas. Observations of some stars in the Milky Way, as well as mathematical modeling, 
show our galaxy to have swallowed up another one in the period from 11 to 8 billion years ago. This hypothetical cosmic structure was dubbed Gaia Enceladus. It is thought that it contributed several billion stars to the Milky Way, as well as great amounts of interstellar gas and dark matter. It is thanks to this tremendous event that most of our galaxy's thick disk formed, and an additional supply of gas led to a stellar baby boom. There is no doubt that spiral arms are the most noticeable structural elements of our galaxy's disk. Usually two major ones are singled out, the Scutum Centaurus arm and the Perseus arm, and two minor ones, the Norma arm and the Carina Sagittarius arm. Sometimes a fifth large arm is taken into account, named after the Cygnus constellation. Galactic arms are areas of especially high star count. Most of interstellar gas is also concentrated here, which is why the rate of star formation in the arms is three to five times higher than in the galaxy on average. They spend the first millions of their lives in open clusters, but gravity forces are too weak to hold the stars close together for a long time. This destabilizes the clusters, and young stars gradually drift away from each other. Traveling along the Carina Sagittarius arm, we will reach a fork that links it to the Perseus arm. The length of this stellar structure reaches 11,000 light years, and its width measures roughly 3,500 light years. It is referred to as the Orion arm, and it is here, 27,000 light years away from the galaxy's center, that the solar system is located. From our planet's perspective, the galaxy's center is seen as a dark abyss. This is the Great Rift, an area of space that shuts out the greater part of the Milky Way from our gaze. It is filled with massive clouds of interstellar gas and dust, and its total mass is as much as a million times that of the Sun. Even though the Great Rift is practically not transparent in the optical range, its matter actively emits radio waves and thermal energy. Spectral analysis data reveals that the clouds are mostly made up of hydrogen with a small percentage of more complex compounds – ammonia, alcohols and amino acids. The Great Rift is thought to be a potential stellar nursery, but it is going to take a while until the first stars light up in that area. While it is still not quite active, let's move on, beyond the galaxy disk. Even though its bright and clearly defined arms attract a lot of attention, there is more to the Milky Way than that. If we look closer, we will see the vastest and the most rarefied of its components, the halo. Its visible part, spherical in shape, stretches for up to 260,000 light years away from the galaxy's center, but accounts for just a few percent of the total mass. The halo contains a great number of globular clusters made up of remarkably old stars over 12 billion years of age and several tremendous stellar streams. The Sagittarius stream, for example, made up of several thousand stars, encompasses our galaxy in an elongated ellipsis, which is almost perpendicular to the main plane. Modeling shows that all these stars are highly likely to have been gravitationally captured by the Milky Way from a dwarf satellite galaxy. Designation Sagittarius DEG. It lies 500,000 light years away from the Milky Way's center and is going to be swallowed up by it completely within several billion years. Another dwarf galaxy has already met a similar fate. Lying in the Canis Major constellation, it was almost destroyed by the Milky Way, which pulled out millions of its stars by gravity forces. Stretching for 200,000 light years and mixing with other stars, this string of stars with a total mass of roughly 100 million solar masses has already wrapped around our galaxy three times. Apart from bright but rare stars and clusters, the halo contains great amounts of gas, whose temperature reaches millions of Kelvin. Also, great amounts of dark matter are thought to be scattered in the vicinity of the Milky Way, forming the so-called dark halo. Stretching for up to 2 million light years, it hardly emits any electromagnetic radiation and can be detected only by gravitational interaction. The dark halo remains an unsolved mystery, 
yet it greatly contributes to the global stability of our galaxy. The solar system is just one of the countless multitude of planetary systems scattered across our galaxy. As we know, it consists of a single star in its main sequence stage and date planets with their satellites. In addition, our system contains over a million small celestial bodies like asteroids, comets and meteoroids. The planet in the solar system lying furthest, at least that we know of, is Neptune. Its orbit's radius measures around 30 astronomical units, which is equivalent to approximately 4 light hours. Amazingly, only a tiny portion of the solar system is encompassed by Neptune's orbit. The remotest object in the system discovered to date is the so-called Far Far Out, lying 132 astronomical units or 18 light hours away from the Sun. Still, even this object, barely visible against a dark background of unfathomable space, is not at all close to the hypothetical Oort cloud, whose inner boundaries lie approximately 2,000 astronomical units away from the center of our system. According to some estimates, its outer boundaries stretch for up to 60,000 astronomical units at the very least, which is around one light year. These limits are predefined by the Sun's gravitational influence, and what lies beyond is interstellar space. Moving further away, we will notice over 50 of all kinds of stars within 20 light years from the Sun. These stars are really diverse, from dim and cold brown dwarfs to bright and widely known objects like Sirius, Procyon and Daltair. Some of them have their own planetary systems with objects potentially capable of nursing and sustaining life. For example, the object known as Gliese 832c, which is 16.1 light years away from the Sun, is similar to our Earth more than any other planet within the solar system that we know of. The average temperature on the exoplanet's surface reaches to 153 Kelvin or 20 degrees Celsius below zero and it takes the astronomical body just 36 Earth days to complete a full orbit around its parent star. In astronomical standards, the distance between us and Gliese 832c is relatively small. However, a space probe setting out from our system at a speed of roughly 17 km per second would take as much as 300,000 years to reach the exoplanet's environs. At our current level of technological advancement, it is impossible to design an interstellar spaceship capable of completing as long a journey as that. The solar system, together with its neighbor stars, is part of the Orion arm, the latter, in its turn, is part of the Milky Way. It contains around 400 billion stars and potentially over a trillion exoplanets of all sorts can be discovered there, according to estimates today. The main diameter of the Milky Way measures around 100,000 light years and the stellar halo may be twice as large. Even though the thickness of the main disk measures about a thousand light years, there is a clearly defined bulge in the galaxy's center. This bulge is roughly 3,000 light years thick. The Milky Way is part of the so-called local group. This is a vast structure comprising over 50 galaxies concentrated within an area of space measuring around 10 million light years in diameter. The Andromeda Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy and the Milky Way are the largest of the lot. Some estimates show that the mass total of the cluster may reach as much as 3 trillion solar masses, with our galaxy and Andromeda accounting for the major part. With the distance from the Earth to Andromeda around 2.5 million light years, it is considered to be our closest galaxy not counting smaller or dwarf ones. Moving on to the next order, the local group forms part of the giant Virgo supercluster made up of over 30,000 galaxies. The supercluster is located within an area of space with a diameter of around 150 million light years. Its mass total is as much as a quadrillion solar masses, or in other words, around a thousand galaxies like the Milky Way. The supercluster is quite flattened 
and around 60% of all the objects it is made up of appear like a flat sheet around 10 million light years thick. Staggering though it may appear on the face of it, this value is actually small in terms of the large-scale structure of the universe. As we zoom out still more, we have a chance of seeing a giant supercluster of galaxies approximately 520 million light years in size. Called Laniakea, it includes several galaxy superclusters, among others the Virgo supercluster and the Great Attractor. The overall mass of this formation measures approximately as much as a hundred quadrillion solar masses. The Great Attractor lies roughly 250 million light years away from our planet and is the gravitational center for all objects lying close by astronomical standards. It cannot be observed from the Earth directly, as the Milky Way is plain thwarts it. That is why the nature of the Great Attractor still remains an unsolved mystery today. Laniakea is part of the large-scale structure of the universe, an elaborate system of galactic filaments, walls and voids, gargantuan areas of emptiness and space. Some of these objects are really incredibly enormous. For example, the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall stretches for around a staggering 10 billion light years. Ever since its discovery in 2013, this superstructure has been considered the most gigantic component of the large-scale structure of the universe. To all appearances, it must be home to millions of galaxies, and the number of stars it contains will probably always defy calculation. The mere existence of a structure like that is a mystery to science, as according to today's accepted theory of universe's evolution, gargantuan clusters like that are simply not supposed to form. But incidentally, this wall, so enormous that the human brain cannot fully appreciate its dimensions, is still just a tiny portion of the observable universe. According to today's cosmological notions, space and the universe is continually expanding with the speed of expansion depending on the distance between objects. The further an observed object lies away from the observer, the faster the distance between the two increases. The rate at which the two mutually recede is not limited by the speed of light, because it's actually space matter that is expanding, which means that at a certain point the two objects will be mutually unobservable. Relic radiation observation shows that the area of the observable universe is a sphere, with a diameter roughly 93 billion light years. According to the theory of relativity, we can see and interact with only those objects that are within this sphere. This conventional spherical area in space is called the matter galaxy, and it may be either all of the universe, or again its tiny portion. For all we know, hypothetically, there may well lie some unknown structures beyond the visible boundaries of space. Such entities are referred to as extra-metagalactic objects, and unfortunately it is impossible to study them today with scientific methods. Still, some astronomical bodies on the edge of the visible universe appear to be moving in ways different from what we would naturally expect, judging by the data we have. Instances of anomalous movements like those may be evidence of the presence of some massive structures beyond the metagalaxy boundaries. Their attraction pervades the space around and influences objects around too. There is a whole plethora of hypotheses as to the structure of the universe beyond the metagalaxy, but most of them are rather of metaphysical nature. For example, some people believe that time and space as we more or less know them are non-existent beyond the boundaries of the universe. The physical laws we are used to do not apply there either and notions of matter, material or energy are virtually senseless. This hypothesis is further elaborated on by the following idea. The metagalaxy accounts for just a part of a yet more complex and larger scale superstructure in space whose makeup and dimensions are too incredible for us to imagine. It is quite possible that this structure could be in a multidimensional space, or else be based on physical principles we have no idea of. This makes the matter galaxy just an insignificant addition to or a partial reflection of this mind-boggling superstructure. According to some interpretations of the anthropic principle, there are other worlds out there beyond the boundaries of the observable universe. 
In those worlds, the values of the fundamental constants like the speed of light or the electron charge are completely different. This hypothesis is in many ways supported by the idea of a multiverse, which schematically appears as foam with lots of bubbles separated from each other by thin walls, but these walls are impenetrable. This makes every universe a separate space with its own physical laws, and for all we know, these laws may be totally different from the ones we're used to. The most radical hypotheses go as far as to deny our world any objective reality whatsoever. According to these, the universe is just a simulation like virtual reality in computers, but on an incredibly advanced level. As a rule, ideas like that imply that there are some super beings or super civilizations out there beyond the reality we're used to whose level of advancement is infinitely higher than ours and whose goals and capabilities are arcane and incomprehensible. However, it goes without saying that it is hardly possible to either confirm or repudiate these hypotheses. Space exploration is a complex, dangerous and fascinating process. Given the incredible diversity of space objects, Space exploration is virtually endless. Every day people find out something new about the universe, and these finds contribute to our mind-expanding experience. And this means that our interstellar journey is only just starting.